Hello, my name is Scott Long. I'm with Netflix, and I'm going to talk about doing 100 gigabits of encryption in the FreeBSD kernel. Um, it was pointed out to me just now that uh, I seem to give this talk every year. Uh, the difference is that that number keeps on being bigger, and uh, bigger numbers make me happy. So uh, hopefully, uh, be able to convey that and impress you guys too. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, about Netflix. Um, I do give this talk pretty often, so I, I know there's a lot of people in this audience that have probably seen this for a few years now. I'll try and go quickly over the uh, the background, because I know I repeat it a lot, but there's also been people here in the audience, too, that uh, want to give appropriate background, too. I'll um, go over a little bit about what we've done in the past and what the new work we've done in the past year that even Netflix has done and where we're going in the future. So about me, uh, I live in Colorado in the United States. I've been with Netflix for about five years now, just under five years. Uh, prior to that, I was with Yahoo, and prior to that, I was with Adaptec, if anyone remembers the old days of setting up controllers. Um, I've been in Colorado now for 19 years, and uh, really, really like it up there. And uh, I've been a FreeBC committer since uh, 2000, and I've been a FreeBC user since 1992, before FreeBC started, technically. That was 386BSD. Um, hopefully more and more people know what Netflix is. We stream movies over the internet, movies and TV shows. Um, we started out doing DVDs by mail in North America. And in 2006, we started uh, streaming over the internet in North America. And since then, we've grown to be worldwide. Um, we, uh, we have over 90 million subscribers now, uh, and we serve a large majority of the internet's traffic in, uh, in North America, we serve a third of the internet's traffic. And uh, by extension, that means that FreeBSD is serving a third of North America's traffic. So we're, uh, that number's actually gone down a little bit in the past year, it was 37% last year. This year it's 33%. I think uh, for, in terms of absolute numbers, we're actually still growing, but the internet is also growing too. So we've been between 33 and 37% now for the last uh, three or four years. So, like I said, we use FreeBSD at Netflix for our video serving. Um, we were using FreeBSD 9 originally, this is FreeBSD 10, and in the past year we switched to FreeBSD 12 dash current. Um, we use Nginx, we're uh, a little bit diverged on Nginx, we call it Nginx 1.9, um, but it's mostly off the shelf Nginx. And we use a very stock uh, x86. 64 bit platform. We use Intel Xeon CPUs, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we use uh, generic motherboards. We we custom design a case, but it's not very custom. We, we base it off of existing case designs for the most part. Um, the only customization that we do is, is for some of them, we try to fit a lot of hard drives into the box. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the Backblaze uh, product, we, we are very similar to that, that we just stick a lot of hard drives in the box. We have three kinds of servers that we produce right now. Um, one's a catalog server that we that we use for serving a large portion of our entire library. Um, that used to hold 36 hard drives. We've actually reduced it in size now to only 24 hard drives. Um, we have a flash appliance that uh, was based on SSDs, now it's based on NVMe. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we have what we call a global appliance, which is a small, very cheap to build, or cheap to deploy box that's uh, kind of compromised between the two. We have some SSD, we have some, we have some hard drive space, but it's only meant to serve 10 gigabits a second, maybe 20 gigabits a second in the future. Um, these are all part of the building blocks of our own connect network. Um, we put these boxes into uh, data centers that belong to ISPs. We basically give them away to our, to our ISP partners around the world for free. The, the deal is, is that they take it for free, they plug it into the network, and it brings the movies closer to their customers. They don't have to pay anymore for uh, expanded network circuits to the to their upstream. They don't have to pay for transit anymore. We don't have to pay for transit anymore either in order to get back and forth. They all live on the network. Um, we also put boxes into um, internet interchanges. That's mostly in North America these days, um, a little bit in Europe. And that's just sort of areas where there either isn't very good uh, ISP coverage or places where we don't have good agreements with ISP yet. Um, but like I said, all of this is built on FreeBSD. Uh, for, you know, for, for 
I think most people up here are, are familiar at least with Netflix at, at, uh, at a, a, a summary level. Um, everything that happens in Netflix when you go to the website or use your smart TV uh, or PlayStation or Xbox, when you first start up, that's all happening in AWS. Um, and, that, and that's all happening on AWS instances that are running Linux. Um, that's all of our, our uh, back-end user database management and uh, 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 logic for uh, predicting which movies you might want to see for your favorites list. Um, also doing things like video encoding. We, uh, we pre-encode all the videos ahead of time into various bit rates and various formats. And that's all done in AWS in a very elastic way. We, we run more instances when we need more, more computing power, and then when we're done, we shrink it back down. Um, but once you hit the play button, once you select your movie and hit the play button, all your video bits from that point on come from FreeBSD and come over this tiered approach that I showed here. Um, so, with that little bit of background about Netflix, let's talk about 100 gigabit networking. Uh, this slide was actually from last year when we just had just achieved being able to serve 100 gigabits a second, unencrypted, uh, on FreeBSD. This was uh, a big partnership that we had with Mellanox and with Intel on uh, basically bringing a 100 gigabit card into FreeBSD that uh, worked well, had a good driver, um, and likewise uh, being the support from Intel on selecting a CPU that would that could, uh, support this. Um, this graph shows us doing uh, about, uh, actually, I say 100 gigabits, we actually reserve about 10% of our capacity for elasticity, so that when we say we're going to serve 100 gigabits, we actually provision our servers to serve 90 gigabits, and that way if everything spikes and needs to go up a little bit, um, they, can, they can absorb that load. So when I say 100 gigabits, I really mean that we're serving 90 gigabits with that little bit of buffer in there too, so that we can, we can make a little bit of oscillation in there. Um, right now we can serve 90 gigabits unencrypted with, uh, with only 40% of the CPU uh, uh, of the Intel uh, Xeon CPU. Um, so that by itself was pretty impressive. A few years ago, we didn't think we'd be able to serve even 40 gigabits <coughs> off of uh, previous speed. It seemed like there are a lot of bottlenecks in the way, and the team at Netflix has done a great job, uh, like I said, working with, with hardware manufacturers and improving uh, the core of FreeBC itself to be able to support this. That we can do it now with 60% idle CPU is really, really impressive. Um, but that 100 gigabits wasn't enough. We decided that we wanted to also be doing TLS encryption on all of our video streams. Um, the reason why, and I talked a little bit about this last year too, is that um, even though our video is already encrypted with DRM, and that's a requirement from the movie studios, uh, so that if our boxes get stolen uh, out of the data center, uh, the thief can't try the hard drives out and rip the movies off the hard drive and, and try and uh, uh, steal them that way. Um, but with but uh, the DRM uh, encoding is only a, a single key that's uh, known by all the clients. So you can still fingerprint that movie string. You may not be able to decode it, but you can still fingerprint it. Um, and what we saw was that uh, there was a growing way of effort uh, in the video industry to try and fingerprint our streams and try and see what our customers were watching, maybe for purposes of doing targeted advertising, maybe for, maybe for purposes a little more nefarious. Um, you know, we, we would hate for uh, someone to watch a movie in a country with a repressive, repressive regime and be in trouble for that. So we decided that we wanted to start doing uh, TLS encryption of all of our streams even on top of the DRM. Um, the problem was is that our initial estimates were that would be that it would cost us between 50 and 60, 67% CPU overhead. Um, <clears throat> we would basically need to, at the time, double or more our provisioning of servers worldwide in order to support this. And that was gonna be really, really expensive. So we started working on how to optimize that. And what we came up with is that uh, we have a classical web serving model where um, basically data is read in from the disk, uh, maybe it's encrypted uh, in, in a library that runs in the web server process space and then it's written back out to the network. Um, 
as you know, our, our video servers are basically just web servers. They just take a file off the disk, respond to requests from, from our users, and send out that report. Um, the downside of this model is that it requires uh, copying of data between kernel and user space uh, that consumes memory bandwidth and consumes CPU bandwidth. And those are the things that make this uh, so incredibly expensive to do, even before you start talking about the computational overhead of doing the encryption algorithms. Um, well, so Nginx and our video serving platform was actually built on top of the send file system call, where the data never needed to go into user land in the first place. So we were really loath to uh, break that model and, and go with the traditional web serving model where everything can be copied. So we tried to figure out how we were going to uh, keep on using send file, keep on using um, the nice Nginx model that we had, but also do encryption. And what we came up with was this idea of having the session management for SSL, the key exchange, that kind of stuff, still happen in user land, still happen in the SSL libraries, but move the bulk encryption up into the kernel and it would be in between the send file block and the number block. Um, basically encrypt in place as the data is coming out of memory and going out to the network. So we came up with this kernel TLS implementation. Um, like I said, right now it builds only on the Sun file system call. Um, but the nice, the nice thing is that it's fairly modular in that it, it uses a thread tool that can be tasked to encryption either in software or in hardware, if hardware is available. Um, it basically extends the socket layer, the SSN call inside the kernels is extended to have a TLS variant. And we added some um, socket options that allow the uh, SSL library, once it's established a session, to then share the session key of the kernel and associate with the null descriptor um, for, that, for that session. Um, limitations are that we don't support any rekeying. If, if a client comes in and a, uh, with a request for, for a, a renegotiation, we deny it, we actually ignore it. Um, and Final ability size of terminate the session because of that, then we just let it terminate. Um, we also don't support any other um, in band uh, uh, message exchange once the session's been set up. Um, and the reason for this is that we manage all the TLS state in the kernel. The, uh, the sequence numbers and the IVs are all managed in the kernel. Once once the keys are shared in from the SSL library, the SSL library doesn't keep any of that state anymore. So if it wanted to try and uh, insert something in, it would uh, it wouldn't know which uh, which shape to use and, and how to keep the sequence going correctly. Um, we also don't support receive. Uh, once again, receive is a hard problem because we have to uh, possibly uh, uh, have two forks of the socket: one that uh, where the endpoint was in the kernel, and one where the endpoint was in the uh, application layer. We don't need that because our web server is very much send only. Uh, we, we receive very little traffic other than just uh, TCP acts. So we kept the problem easy, um, but it wanted to be very, very effective for us. Um, these are the results I shared last year. I wanted to use these as a, as a baseline. Um, it's kind of a, a confusing table to read, but the end result was that on the hardware that we could talk about at the time, that's very important, the hardware we could talk about at the time, which was a uh, Haswell series Intel Xeon CPU, we could uh, achieve pretty close to line rate on 40 gig, inter uh, 40 gig interface. That's the box is in the lower right corner. We're using 40 gig interface, we can achieve 36, which is our 90% goal, um, with only 53% CPU being used. Um, you know, compared to uh, using the old, uh, using the traditional OpenSSL user land, where we can only get 30% uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 gigabits per second. Uh, it's that 75% CPU, but we actually couldn't push it higher than that because other bottlenecks in the system cause uh, the system to become unstable. So this was a pretty good improvement that we that we saw last year. Um, And at the end of last year's slide, I also snuck in this teaser to show that uh, with some unnamed hardware, we were actually above 60 gigabits a second. Um, 
I can talk about that in hardware now. That was the, uh, the Broadwell series of Xeons um, using a 100 gigabit interface. This was at pretty close to 100% CPU. Excuse me. Um, but it was, it was a nice little teaser that we had to show where we were going. Um, so now I'll talk about the improvements that we made, including that last graph and where, where we're going. Um, it was broken into several different efforts. Uh, one, I'll talk about the server changes and the hardware changes that we made. Um, then I'll talk about the, the bottlenecks that we, that we encountered where we thought we were supposed to get more performance than we weren't. Um, and then I'll talk about the tools that we, that we used and then some of the more recent efforts that we're uh, working on up to right now. So for the server improvements, um, we switched from SATA SSDs to NVMe. We've been playing around with NVMe up to that point, but we realized that that was really going to be the way forward for us for performance. Each drive can give us 30 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Um, that's using four lanes of PCI Express 3.0. Um, technically, you should be able to get 32. Once again, I'm trying to be conservative and say 90%. Um, so uh, with those with four drives, we could get you know should be able to get close to 120 gigabits a second of, of bandwidth off of the drives and, and into the core of the system. Um, we also switched, like I said, from Haswell to Rodwell CPUs, from 14 core to 16 core CPU. Um, and with that, uh, our ISA, uh, the ISA library, ISA library that we were using also improved. And I, I should talk about that a little bit too as background. Um, the nice thing that Intel gave us last year was a hand-coded, uh, hand-tuned assembly library called ISAL. Uh, it was originally meant for storage. It was, really, it was originally meant to do things like compression and CRC32, but we also had some routines for doing uh, AES GCM and AES CDC. So we, we, we saw that and we, we grabbed onto it, and it turned out to perform better than Open, open SSL and Boring SSL at the time. Because like I said, it was, it was hand-coded, uh, and assembly was hand-tuned by some really smart people. It was using not just AES and I, uh, acceler uh, acceleration instructions on the CPU, but also ADX. Um, so that was part of our strategy of making this capture last year. And when we went to the Broadwell CPUs uh, this past year, it took it made use of uh, more uh, more optimization opportunities in that CPU. Um, so just basically switching our hardware around and uh, switching our ISA library to something newer got us from 58 gigabits a second to 65 gigabits a second. This is about where we were last year. The 58 is where we were um, with Haswell and with a uh, higher gigabit interface. Um, but at 65 gigabits a second, we were kind of confused why we weren't getting more. Uh, if we tried to go above that at all, our CPU load uh, increased exponentially to 100% very, very quickly. Um, and what we discovered was that the problem was memory bandwidth. Um, our original calculations based on Intel data sheets were that we should be able to get 400 gigabits a second of uh, throughput through the memory. And with doing line TLS like we're doing, we have to cross the memory bus four times. Once from the disk into memory, and then once from the memory into the CPU to start encryption, and once from the CPU back out of memory uh, with the encrypted data and then once from memory out to the NIC to send it out to the internet. Um, so at 480 gigabits a second theoretical bandwidth from memory, we felt that we should be able to get pretty close because we needed 400 gigabits for, for, for the data and then some other overhead for operating system housekeeping. Um, what we found using PCM tool uh, that Intel had developed was that we were actually maxing out at 48 gigabytes a second or about 384 gigabits a second. Um, and after talking with, with our representatives at Intel, you know, the truth was actually told that reality was that you know, there's the theoretical max that they advertise and then there's the reality, which is that uh, you get a little bit less. Um, so we, we verified that. Um, we, we, we wrote some quick and dirty tools to measure raw memory bandwidth. We saw that you know, outside of all this other um, other noise of, of, of serving the internet that just a very simple test also got 40 gig, gig, gigabits a second. So we knew that was really going to be our max. Um, so, and that that's started to make sense when we took our 60, 
five gigabit number and multiply it by the four travels that it has to take across memory bus, we got to 260 gigabits a, a second. That meant that we were being about 66% efficiency of the memory. 66% of memory bandwidth was being used by our video data, and the other 33% was being used by OS housekeeping. Um, that isn't great, but, but that was a, a reasonable number for, for what we expected. So we took the easy solution, and we just bought more expensive memory. Um, going from DDR4 when 1866 to 2400 is a very significant difference in price. Um, it also changes the electrical loading requirements on the memory bus, so we went from being able to populate uh, um, eight slots in a socket to only being able to populate four slots, uh, which forced us to then go down to 128 gigabytes of memory in the system, down from 256. Um, but it was successful. We got um, over 10% improvement, 15% uh, actually improvement in just changing our memory. So then knowing that uh, memory was a, was a bottleneck that we needed to look more at, we started looking at the ICL libraries. And um, like I said, these libraries all very much can do an assembly, and they, and they use ABX to, to operate uh, in uh, wide words. What we found was that um, an L3 cache line is 64 bytes wide, and the ICL libraries were offering uh, 32 bytes at a time. But what was happening was that if we went to store the first 32 bytes of an operation, the L3 cache was actually doing a read, modify, write. It was actually bringing in the full 64 bytes into its cache line, then modifying the 32 that we gave it, and then flushing it back out whenever it uh, needed to flush it back out. But that meant that for doing writes, we were actually creating read traffic across the bus, which was once again consuming bus bandwidth. So um, we originally talked to the ICL team at Intel about creating some non-temporal versions of the library, basically versions that would bypass the cache for loading and storing, because we felt that um, you know it might be a nice benefit to not pollute the L3 cache with uh, data that was just gonna, that was encrypted that was going to be thrown away immediately anyway. Um, but this this highlighted that this was more than just convenience; it was also something we had to do in order to save our memory down. So we worked with that team. Uh, made that change, and the result was another 10% improvement in our performance. And like I said, that was just by basically reducing the amount of, of waste of bandwidth that came from doing reads when we were trying to, when we were best part of doing writes. So at 83%, we, uh, we kind of pat ourselves on the back. We started using Btune to look for more things that we could do to uh, improve performance. We found a, a, a few percentages here and there. Um, a big one was that we found that MBUFFs were uh, causing a lot of cache line misses and, and excessive cache line usage. Um, and in looking, looking in, we found that uh, the MBUFF header and the MBUFF EXT uh, data structures lined up side by side with we're consuming three cache lines. And that last cache line, that third cache line, we were only using two fields in it. Um, <coughs> So it seemed kind of a waste of to be putting in a, an extra cache line in every single packet that we, we transmitted just for two fields. So we started looking at um, ways that we could improve that. And we just made a very simple change. Um, the top is just before the box after. We basically just moved two, two fields down to below the cache line boundary, the ext3 and the ext2. What we found was that ext3, we were never using it in our use case. Um, so it was, it was pretty much wasted, and EXDR2 was only being examined every, uh, very rarely. So um, we had a flag type to, to point to whether or not it would be used. The flag was already being pulled into the cache. Um, so by not having to examine it on every single packet uh, and only examine the flag first, we were able to move that out too. Um, this was only a couple percent, only a couple percentage change. Um, probably not the even chart, but it did. It was measurable, and it did point to the fact that we need to start looking more at data structures. So we came to this conclusion, um, and both circuits are harm harmful. And I, I say that with a with, with a smile because um, they're wonderfully uh, uh, extendable and easy to work with. But <laughs> what? 
And you can just, you know, tack on at the beginning, the end, in between, you can shuffle stuff around. It's all very easy because it's all links and linked lists and pointers to pointers and yes. Could be worse. Um, but these don't work very well in modern CPUs that rely on optimized use of caches and uh, uh, very slow memory pipelines compared to CPU instruction pipelines. So we always knew that this was a problem that really highlighted. Um, the SO sandwich is kind of the, the top layer access point into the socket layer of being able to send data into the TCP stack. Um, it was sending in large chains of, of that bus, large linked lists of that bus, because we were operating at a page at a time for encryption. And we, we put in four pages for 16K, um, plus morning bus with TLS header and, and trailer, plus morning bus for things like the IP and TCP headers. So you wind up with this very long chain of MBUS just to, just to send one packet out. And that long chain, even if TCP didn't care about it, down the driver was having to block a link list and um, ultimately read in headers that I really didn't need to read. It, you know, we could kind of give it the summary information up front. We didn't need to, to, to have it keep on reading headers that same just because of this, basically the same information. Um, so last year we experimented with, with a idea of doing n buff arrays, something called MD map, where we took these four, five, six, seven n buffs, whatever it took, and squashed them into an array and just send that array through. Um, that way, um, by reading that MBUF map, it could get all the pointers to all the actual MBUFs in one shot without having to do cache misses in order to walk this linked list one element at a time. Um, the results were promising. I talked about a little bit last year, um, but it wasn't enough. So something that we're starting with now is, is a whole new MEXT type called EXT PGS. <coughs> And what this does is basically pack in all the data that we need for a TLS message, all the pages of data, the header and the footer, into the EXT area of the MBUF. We now probably consume um, four cache points for the MBUF instead of only two, two to three like we talked about before. But we only need to read that one MBUF at the front, and that one MBUF covers the entire 16K message that we're going to send over the wire now. Um, Basically, it eliminates, you know, once it's all read in, it eliminates all further cache misses. And the um, nice thing is that we were able to do it in a way that's transparent to the network driver. We were able to extend the bus DNA layer that does the actual uh, 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 virtual to physical address conversions to the hardware to be able to recognize this type so that um, drivers don't need to care about it. It's, it's much less uh, intrusive to the rest of the stack than the MD, uh, MD map stuff was. So with that now, we are at just under 90 gigabits a second. Um, unfortunately, that's with uh, only 50% CPU idle. Um, so we're pretty much close to our limit on CPU. Um, but that is with 100% ASQCM traffic. Um, like I said, 85% IPv4, 15% IPv6. Um, we think that we're going to have to start looking at IPv6 now as the world moves over towards that protocol, uh, we recognize that in previous that stack works, but it's not well optimized yet. So we'll probably have to start looking at optimizing that stack. Uh, once again, going back to using tools like B2 and PCM and, and, PC, and uh, PMC. So um, where we're going to go from now, like I said at the beginning, um, our communication between the SSL library and the kernel is done with uh, socket options and right now they're TCP socket options. Uh, we need to think about making those be generic so that uh, just basic stuff like being able to do uh, loopback tests on ourselves uh, where we don't want to use uh, TCP, we don't want to use streams. We could do that, so we want to make it generic. Uh, we also want to think about what this means for datagram sockets and DTLS. Um, things like uh, Quick from Google use uh, UDP and can possibly use DTLS, so we want to think about how this would interact with that. Um, like I also said, we don't do anything with receive mode right now. Um, I think in order to get this submitted upstream, we might start thinking about that. Um, also, our, our implementation is very specific to send file and not just a normal uh, write system call. So we have some prototype code for uh, a, a normal write system call, but uh, we haven't tested it out well yet. 
Um, we can start thinking about how we stand up. How we standardize this with the fabrics of Linux. Uh, there's a lot of people in Linux that are trying to solve the same problem. Um, they're not quite as far along as we are, but they're getting there. Um, and they're doing with their, their key TLS uh, effort. And they're doing things like uh, split uh, endpoint sockets where you have a kernel endpoint and user land endpoint so that your SSL library can inject uh, uh, frames in. Um, so we're, we're, we're starting to think about that. We're starting to work with hardware vendors about uh, what that's going to look like and also what it's going to look like with having hardware accelerated TLS in a deck. Um, so instead of encrypting as a middle step in our pipeline, we would send unencrypted uh, uh, MBUS to the NIC card with, uh, with a key and have the NIC card encrypted as it's saying it out on, saying it out on the wire. Um, so once again, in order to, to, to make that work, we need to talk to our vendors about uh, APIs and why to use an API that's not going to be just private to us or just not private to FreeBSD. Um, another thing, another hotspot that we have, this FGIF from data. Uh, probably, if you're looking through the kernel right now, trying to structure to find that you won't find because it's an extension that we put into the kernel. And what that basically means is that um, we need to provide a pointer to the file descriptor into the, uh, the, the, the worker thread the kernel that's doing the actual bulk encryption. Like I said, uh, SSL, when it negotiates the encryption session with, uh, with the other side, it does a socket option to associate uh, the key material with that file descriptor. And so uh, right now we have a brute force play. There's no back corner between a socket and a file descriptor. So we have to, every time a new session is, is started, um, we have to go through and, and read all the file descriptors in the system and look for the try and match them up to the socket that we're talking about and pull the key material out that way. So we got to look at, at uh, how we're going to fix that because when we have you know 78,000 sockets back in the system, that's a very expensive operation. Um, our wish list going forward. Um, it's very much now a question that uh, with next generation Xeons from Intel to Skylake. Uh, I don't know how much I can talk about the exact details, but you know, next server generation, we could easily get 200 gigabits of serving. Uh, it's going to have enough memory channels so we can do that right now. It's enough PCI channels so we can almost get there. Uh, but then beyond that, what's the next step? Uh, we've been using single socket systems because we don't want to uh, invoke uh, all the pain and suffering of NUMA. But, um, you know, with, with AMD, I, I apologize to our Intel friends here to talk about AMD, but they do have a very interesting product here coming up with Naples with eight memory channels and 128 PCI with PCIe lanes. Uh, it's more of a PCI than you can get a dual socket uh, Xeon configuration right now. So it's something to think about, um, but even then, we're probably going to have to start looking at things like uh, hardware accelerated encryption, like we talked about with uh, encrypting the inline and the network card. Um, or even more exotic science experiments, like being able to use the L3 cache as temporary storage and not use memory at all, so that when the data comes in off the disk, it sits in L3, never gets flushed up in memory, and the CPU just sits there and works in and out of L3 as it goes through its pipeline and never goes to memory. Um, but that's a really tricky thing to get right, so uh, we're hoping that uh, the hardware vendors come up and, and uh, solve these problems for us in hardware. Um, and last, we, we want to get this sort of upstream. Uh, we don't feel like any of it is proprietary. We want to get people using it. Uh, we're discussing ways that we can share it right now as we work on the upstream processing. Um, you know, obviously, there's things like Fabricator, but um, so we're, we're examining our options right now for being things shared. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of things like that FB get data or from data um, that are kind of hacks right now that we want to keep on working on defining. Um, and there's lots of things about open cell that we've changed that are kind of hacked, but we are working on getting there. And one wants uh, a preview of the code or a patch set, just let me know, and I'd be happy to do what I can to share it privately. So that's there. Any questions? Yes? Uh, you said uh, you have been using the uh, VQ, now that you find that uh, cache type or four dialogues. Yeah. How does that look like? I have never used that before. I probably just don't have any screenshots of it. Um, it's there. It's available for FreeBSD. It's a supported product from Intel for FreeBSD. Um, it's a little bit complicated to set up. 
Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces there, and you wind up having to actually run the graphical interface part of it on a Windows, Mac, box if there's no native client for, uh, for FreeBSD right now. Um, but uh, basically, it lets you uh, do uh, site by site build and code line by code line inspection of everything from cache usage to CPU cycles used to um, memory cycles used, all that kind of stuff. Do you have to add code? No. No, it, it, it's able to, uh, it, it's kind of like uh, PCM. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it just uses the existing L symbols. Um, so it's, it's convenient that way. How specific is it to TLS? Like, if you're using the set sock op, can it do ASGCM for something that's not TLS? Uh, we have not considered that. Um, are you talking like IPsec or something like that? Yeah, or SSH. Or SSH. Um, I think we should talk about that. Yeah, it is specific to TLS right now, but uh, there's no reason why it has to stay that way because the code is meant to be modular. Right. Most of the TLS stuff is done by the web server, right? So all the framing is done in the kernel, all the bulk groups are done in the kernel. It's just you know connection set up is done in the web server now. Anything else? Sure. So how, how much have you rolled out this really fast stuff into your actual production? Um, so it's been rolled out now for about a year. Um, right now we're we're still at 100% at, at of our clients using it. Uh, we're at about 30 to 40%. Uh, that's growing as more and more of our client software gets converted over to be able to use it. It's never going to get to full 100% because there's always going to be ancient smart TVs that don't have a smart enough processor, or don't have a fast enough processor to do encryption. But it will converge towards that as time goes on. But yeah, it's been quite down for, uh, for over a year. So what percentage is going up encrypted? Uh, about 40%. Anything else? Uh, have you compared the performance impact of IPv4 versus IPv6? Like, you, have you measured a, a pure v4 system versus a pure v6 system? So, we want to. Right now, our machines that we have set aside for testing are only in the US, so it's hard to attract enough v6 traffic to be 100% v6 right now. Uh, well, I hear Comcast is doing about 35% V6, so maybe you can talk to some friends over there. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, that, that is a goal, like I said, that, that's something that we're realizing we're going to have to work on here going forward. So uh, whether it's it's doing some, some specialized steering of traffic or whether it's putting some test nodes into Europe or into Asia, right. we'll get there. Yes? Uh, does it mean you will have to use TSO for the uh, live packet? It does. So you use the TSO? We do, yes. Yeah, it, we'll still be using TSO. Um, now, with that said, we're also doing something that's completely counter to this, which is uh, uh, we're actually moving away from TSO in some cases to do something that we call RAC uh, that tries to be better about congestion control. And through that, uh, you know, large TSO chunks are, are, are bad for congestion control. Um, so we're still working on the balance. And, you know, full TSO is 64K, a TLS message is 16K. Uh, but we may wind up going down to 8K or, or even 4K in order to uh, cooperate with rack and packet casing and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's still a, a area of heavy research right now.